Good afternoon. I'm Martina Davis, Associate Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm thrilled to be introducing Sergeant Harry Ettlinger. Harry grew up a German Jew under growing Nazi oppression in the 1930s. Common freedoms were stripped away, and the Ettlingers had no choice but to flee the country in 1938, making it to the United States and settling in Newark, New Jersey. Just six years later, Harry was drafted into the United States Army. Harry's fluency in Germany, in German, was an immense asset, and it placed him at the Nuremberg Trials as an interpreter. While in Munich awaiting assignment, Harry offered his services to the monuments, fine arts, and archives effort, and soon found himself translating testimony from Hitler's personal photographer. The first priority of the monuments men was to return 73 cases containing stained glass belongings to the Strasbourg Cathedral in France on orders directly from General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Harry's tenure with the Monuments Men would last a year and a half. Harry Ettling Ettlinger's is only one, is one of only five surviving members of the Monuments Fine Arts and Archives effort, a group of 400, 345 men and women from 13 countries that worked tirelessly to recover and return cultural treasures stolen by the Nazis during World War II. The Monuments Men, as they, been, as they became known, recovered as many as five million individual works of fine arts and artifacts worth billions of dollars today, which the Nazis had confiscated from museums, houses of worship, and rightful owners. By helping to assure the reclamation, restoration, and preservation of the very objects that defined cultures, the extraordinary men and women of the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives initiative preserved the richness of European culture for generations to come. Harry Ettlinger, Harry Ettlinger and the Monuments men did more, perhaps, for cultural preservation than any other group or initiative in the 20th century. As Harry has said himself, that's what made our war different. It established the policy that to the victor do not go the spoils. The whole idea of returning property to its rightful owners is, in wartime was unprecedented. After the war, Harry went on to earn a master's degree, master's degrees in mechanical engineering and business administration before becoming deputy program director for a company that produced guidance systems for submarine launched nuclear weapons. Harry is also active in the leadership of several local and regional veterans organizations, and at the tender age of 88, Harry remains engaged, dedicated to, dedicated to volunteerism, and committed to advocacy. Before Sergeant Ettlinger speaks, I'd like to make a, a few, uh, rec recognize a few people. I'd like to first start by introducing or recognizing President Kathy Waldron, the president of William Patterson University. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Robert and Marie de Blasi, who are both William Patterson alumni, <laughs> for making that initial introduction. Professor Joanne Cho, the chair of the history department, for her efforts in coordinating the planning of this presentation. Sergeant Yvette Butler, the coordinator of Veterans Office, the coordinator for the Veterans Office. Um, for arranging our student veterans participation, and Melissa Williams of the History Department, who did a lot of the behind the scenes work that goes on, that goes often, uh, that often goes unnoticed at events like this. Is she somewhere? Like that? Um, I'd also like to recognize our student veterans. Um, they have uh, sacrificed so much on, on our behalf, and we're very proud that we have uh, over 200 student veterans at William Patterson. Would you please stand? It is my sincere privilege and honor to introduce Sergeant Harry Edlinger. This is a total unexpected honor that you have uh, given me this morning over here. Believe me, 
I never in my whole life expected something like that. So uh, uh, it's one of the good things that happened, and I want to thank every one of you for giving me this particular gift this morning, or here, this afternoon. I don't want to be behind the times. <laughs> During World War II, there was a great decision made on the part of our government that instead of taking spoils of war like has been done previously for millenniums, we got involved in returning stolen works of art, especially in view that under starting off with the very top, Adolf Hitler saw to it over here that uh, uh, many of the art treasures that had been created over the centuries were now in his hand. But probably more importantly, that the elimination of entire cultures were ordered by him in order to provide him with the necessary uh, culture that made all the Germans superior to every other human being in this particular world. If you didn't know by now, all human beings are equal. Just think about it when you go into the next next time you go into the bathroom. <laughs> I being pulled out going into combat in which of the eight buddies of mine, three of them were killed in action during the Battle of the Bulge and five of them were wounded within 40, uh, within 40 days. I only found that out about a couple of years later when I met uh, when I met a buddy of mine over here who I, uh, uh, when I joined, when I was drafted in the United States Army, my brother joined the Navy because he wanted to be, he had decided to become a cook. But uh, when we came to this country, on our way uh, to this country, we ran into the hurricane of 1938 in which 100 people got killed in Connecticut, and I was seasick for three days. And I finally was able to come along and keep some food down on the holiest of holy days in the Jewish religion, Yom Kippur, on which you're supposed to fast. So I didn't want to have anything to do with the Navy. <laughs> so when I graduated, I joined every one of the boys in my class into the armed forces of this country. And I got drafted and uh, became trained as an infantryman and went, uh, was sent back overseas and uh, on our way into the battle of uh, uh, battle over here, I got pulled out. I didn't know why. But uh, for the next three months, I uh, stayed with this temporary camp as we traveled from uh, France through Belgium, 
threw things into, into Munich. And there I was told somebody could use me uh, because I spoke and wrote the language. And so the next day I uh, volunteered <laughs> to a captain that uh, if he could use my services of being able to speak and read and write German, uh, I, uh, I would like to join his particular group. And he told me, there's an empty seat over there. Go sit down, and the guy next to you will tell you what to do. <laughs> that was my introduction into the Monuments Men. And uh, by the way, I haven't lost my uh, accent since that particular time. <laughs> there, was a, um, there was a movie that was made about eight years ago. Uh, and uh, it was called The Rape of Europa. And after uh, an hour and a half, I'm on it for about two, uh, for about 30 seconds. And I never forget when it was played on uh, Channel 13 on PBS. Uh, the next day, I, I got a call from a high school classmate of mine who told me uh, that how dare I, uh, I uh, was when at 4 o'clock in the morning, I spoke as part of that movie which she had on. And she said, don't wake me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. If you want to talk to me, call me up during the day. You know? But I spent, as I said, uh, 10 months. <coughs> Later on, I was assigned to fill it out cases that contained stolen works of art out of uh, two salt mines in southern Germany, in which they had 40,000 cases of art saved, uh, uh, stored there in order to keep them safe, 700 feet down under the, uh, under the ground over here. and. Uh, I was the guy who, uh, the American, who f was in charge of seeing to it that those boxes, 900 of them, that contained stolen works of art, got, uh, got found, got, uh, and uh, was moved to the, moved to the uh, top, and I saw to it that they were put on trucks or trains to be returned to either uh, where they came from or one of the collection points, which you see up there. This was the first one that was established in order to bring stolen works of art to, uh, to a site where they could be turned over to representative of one of the 13 countries from which it was taken. This particular one happened to be the former headquarters of the Nazi party in, in Germany, and it was located in, uh, in Munich. And uh, I had joined the monuments men in the week in which Captain Jim Romer, who headed up the monuments men in the American zone had uh, take, had uh, uh, seen to it that this this building became the first collection point of the monuments men, and uh, he talked General Patton out of preventing General Patton wanted this building to become the headquarters of the. I believe Third Army, and uh, Jim Warmer talked him out of it. He said, we need it for a much bigger purpose 
namely the saving and return of stolen works of art. I spent 10 months in the, in the mines, and one of the things, you see a, a painting here. This painting was the pride and joy of the Museum of Art in the city in which I was born. But as a Jew, I was not allowed to come along and see it. Uh, until I saw it over here uh, when we uh, made photographs of items in the mine in, as part of a report that Lieutenant Ford, who's on the left-hand side, uh, made up in order to tell the, uh, tell, uh, the government what we in this office in, in Heilbronn and Kochendorf did in order to rescue 900 items that we deemed to be the property of other countries. The first ones happened to be the uh, stained glass windows from the Cathedral of Strasbourg. And it was one of the first items that were returned to, uh, uh, to the other country over here. This particular one was uh, a self-portrait of Rembrandt that was the pride and joy of the art museum in the city that I was born, Karlsruhe, and uh, it was, as I said, the return. By the way, it's probably, especially in view of the fact that I'm going around the country showing it. Uh, every time I do over here, it goes up in value by a million bucks. <laughs> and I don't get a penny of it. <laughs> However, my grandfather had a collection of prints, especially prints that uh, small ones that fitted in the inside of a book. Uh, which uh, identified the owner of that particular book. It was a hobby that was prevalent during the late 1800s and the early 1900s when affluent people had their own library in their own mansion. And they were called ex libris. And my grandfather had a collection of 1,500 of those that are now sitting in my closet. <laughs> so if anybody wants to come along and buy any of them, <laughs> they're for sale. <laughs> However, uh, so uh, uh, one of the, uh, and among his collection also was a print. Uh, he had 1,500 prints that were made by artists who covered, who copied this particular painting among them. And five years ago, I found the print over here of this particular painting, and it's now hanging in my living room. It's not worth 10 million bucks. <laughs> it's not even worth a million dollars. Some lady from Sotheby's told me, we might get $300 for it. I told her it's not for sale. <laughs> this particular painting was one of the more important ones, was one of the more noteworthy ones uh, that was in uh, the Kochendorf salt mine. It's a painting by a painter by the name of Grünwald, who lived in the 1600s of uh, the Madonna. And it's a property of a church in a small town in Germany of Stubach. And uh, I, have, I was told 
that this painting that Jim Rohmer, who was the curator for the Metropolitan Museum of Fine Arts in New York and later on became its director, offered the momentous sum in, 19, uh, in the 1940s of $2 million for this particular painting. And they told him it's not for sale. So if you may have a half a billion bucks, you might want to come along and visit them and offer a half a million bucks over here for this particular painting, and they will tell you it's not for sale. So you save the half a billion dollars. <laughs> this particular uh, photograph shows you the conditions that were used to store works of art, which some of them you will see up, up here in the front for uh, publicity purposes, this photograph was taken. None of these paintings were stolen. They were returned to German institutions, and you can see the boxes that they were in, the wooden boxes that they were in. Uh, the salt mines, had clean atmospheres, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 to 60 percent humidity, ideal conditions for storing works of art. And on top of that, ideal conditions for the Germans during the, during the war to establish underground factories. And one of the things that happened in both mines that they brought down immense machines to manufacture one of the items to manufacture jet engines. And they had a program in the Heilbronn mine to manufacture jet engines. The first one, uh, five years before we got into production of that particular, uh, that particular device over here, that particular form <coughs> of engines uh, on it. And these would have uh, enabled the German Air Force to fly faster and more, uh, more uh, at, uh, able for them to shoot down every one of our planes. The jet engines, the uh, parts, were being manufactured by Hungarian Jewish slave laborers that had been sent, they had been sent to Auschwitz, to the crematorium, and had been selected because of uh, the fact that they were uh, middle-aged and able to come along and do that. They were selected to become slave laborers, uh, and uh, they were on the verge of doing that. That pushed our forces to get to Heilbronn and Korndorf faster than any other place because of, uh, if they had been unsuccessful, as I said, uh, World War II would have lasted another year to two years because the uh, German Air Force would have been able to shoot down every one of our planes. Um, I. Uh, found that out uh, only about 10, 15 years ago. I was not aware that uh, this thing actually happened uh, during my time that I spent underneath. You see here a picture of uh, two miners that uh, worked with me. When, I, when we took a look at the stained glass window, one of the 
73 boxes filled with the stained glass window thrust work. And uh, when that happened, I still was a buck private. I was a buck private for 18 months. And when they found out over here that I did the work uh, that uh, was done by uh, captains and first lieutenants, they finally promoted me. So I became, uh, so in the last, bef just before I retired, they, uh, they made me a sergeant inside of, I went from a buck private to a sergeant inside of three months. <laughs> a three striper over here on it. Uh, I uh, was, uh, in retrospect, I felt very, very good that uh, on the work that I did. Uh, and uh, as, as it turned out to be, all of a sudden, because people realized what I did, a, uh, a young Jewish boy was finally honored by the German public. And uh, so I felt over here that uh, I finally did a help over here to uh, provide the German population with some uh, honest education in what some of their fellow human beings were all about. And I think over here that uh, I have uh, talked for quite a while. And, uh, and I'm going to give uh, people out here an opportunity to ask me some questions about uh, perhaps of something that I'm, I, I know. And uh, I will make every attempt to get those four billion brain cells that are up here working and uh, providing th a little bit more information from you. Okay, so, yeah, if, please. Uh, Harry, I saw the movie, was very moved by it. Wanted to know, as soon as I walked out, I said, I want to know how factual the movie is to the actual story. And when I saw that you were going to speak here, I said, I better ask <coughs> the actual guy who was there. So how factual is the movie to the actual story of the Monument Men? Well, the movie covers uh, the places which had uh, works of uh, art uh, in those particular mines. And there were some scenes that were uh, true to form. One of them over here happened to be the one in which they had uh, all of this uh, gold and everything else like that. Uh, however, uh, I can tell you that uh, while they covered many of the scenes, while they covered many of the places, the actual scenes are Hollywood. <laughs> For instance, and I showed you this morning, in the movie, Heilbronn was a, uh, they had, uh, they had paintings out in the open, and uh, paintings out in the open and discarded over here, and the building was a one, one, one uh, building, one story building over here that uh, this particular mine had, uh, as far as the movie was concerned. I showed you today over here the, the fact over here of the real scene, the boxes, the boxes in which they were located, okay? Uh, and as you can come along and see, uh, they were very orderly, and you don't see any paintings or any works of art. 
they were all inside the boxes. So they had, at the scenes were Hollywood, believe it or not, not over here. I mean, I like the picture, I like the movie, don't misunderstand me. But, uh, and while they located, uh, while they had the uh, location accurately, uh, they, they made up their, they had their own scenery, so to speak, that they uh, introduced in them. For instance, one of the other things, uh, the man who played, the young man who played my part, all you saw of him, that he was driving a Jeep and a thing. Yes, I drove a Jeep from where I was, uh, uh, from where I was, in the place where I was uh, uh, slept, things like that, to the mine itself. But believe me, my job was underground, in the mines itself, in order to locate it. And uh, one of the pictures that you saw uh, provided that particular scenery. I had two miners, as I said, reporting to me in each one of the two mines. Where, so they made up their they made up their own story in order to make it uh, pleasant for you to to come along and pay uh, <laughs> ten bucks. More. More. More? Yeah. You got yeah. cheated. Yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Robin Jones. I work for the DEP, and I used to work with your wife, uh, Memi. Yes. And you used to come and visit us, and many people from the office have been following uh, the ongoings before the movie came out. Uh, the movie's great. Um, I, I have a bunch of questions, but so does everybody else. Uh, I wanted to know, first of all, whether you have a, uh, a list of other places you're going to. You're kind of like the 1960s folk artist going to all the colleges. I mean, <laughs> have you got a list of other places you're going to? Because other people in my office would, would like to hear you speak as well. I don't have my calendar with me. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I got one or two other places that have been oh, scheduled. Okay. So Maybe you mentioned in, in the movie, which I really enjoyed, uh, was that the Russians were coming, the Russians were coming. Um, how many, so you got a certain amount of artwork out, but did the Russians get most of it? Well, what they showed is the biggest collection, as far as the monuments men were concerned, is the 6,600 paintings that were under control, uh, were uh, taken by, or as taken by Hitler himself in order to provide uh, the painting that he needed for his museum, that part, that he was going to establish in the uh, provincial capital where he was born, Linz, Austria, okay? Uh, however, I can tell you this much, while the Russians eventually were in charge of uh, Austria. Uh, they were not. Uh, they were not minutes away from from getting to Althausse at the movie set. Right. That took a couple of weeks, and during the particular time, though, all of those paintings in Althausse, which the movie showed were shipped, were taken out of the mine and shipped to, uh, to the collection point in, uh, in Munich, which was one of uh, three collection points. We had, there was one in Munich, there was another one in Wiesbaden, and a third one that specialized in, that specialized in archives and Judaica, in other words, Taurus and uh, what fits on Taurus in the Jewish religion uh, in Offenbach, they uh, were established uh, by the monuments men. And I didn't cover them over here. I don't have any pictures. But uh, I ended up sending uh, uh, three of our shipments 
that was taken of uh, stolen works of art out of Kochendorf and Heilbronn was sent to uh, was sent to Wiesbaden. One of them, the last, the first one was the stained glass windows that was sent to Strasbourg, and the last one that I was involved in was uh, sending um, sending a shipment by train to the Louvre in Paris. Okay. I want to let you know that one of the things that uh, uh, one of the things over here that uh, we found in the mine in Heilbronn with fireworks and uh, uh, to celebrate Hitler's victory. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, obviously that did not come into being. <laughs> However, when our guy, when the men of the military government detachment to which I later on became a member of, when they captured Heilbronn and went down into the Heilbronn mine, they found the fireworks and found also a lot of firecrackers. And uh, during my stay in with this particular group, when we had uh, something to eat, two of the men would come along and uh, take firecrackers and throw them from the kitchen into the dining room or from the living room into the dining room and for month at a time, our, uh, our dinners, what we at uh, uh, breakfast, lunch, and uh, dinner was, uh, uh, let's say, accompanied by firecrackers. <laughs> that was not pleasant over here. So, uh, however, however, I found out over here that uh, I used those fire, I knew that the fire works. So on the 4th of July, 1946, I saw to it that the 4th of July was being celebrated in Heilbronn, Germany, by having the miners arrange for a 35 minute fireworks <laughs> with the first one in Germany after the war ended. So we're here. Well, unbeknownst to me, I'll, I'll be finished. <laughs> unbeknownst to me at the same time, unbeknownst to, to us at the same time, the city of Florence, Italy, had stored 700 cases of their artwork in the Kochendorf mine. And on the same day that we had fireworks in Heilbronn, they took out their 700 boxes and shipped them back to Florence, Italy over here. So it was not just uh, German stuff, but there was also stuff over here. And by the way, you can read about that in a book called Saving Italy, written by Robert Etzel, that tells what the monuments men did in Italy to, uh, afterwards over here on it. Well, thank you very much uh, for asking questions, but I know that the, there are three classes uh, are present here, and students are to be given extra credit, so they <laughs> need to also have a chance to speak out. So if any students have uh, questions, yes. I was just wondering, are there any artifacts that were especially like moving to you or beautiful to you that were something that's close to your heart today still? Anything in particular? Are you asking me if I took anything? No. <laughs> Anything that you could still see in your mind today that was just especially beautiful to you or meaningful to you that it stays with you today? Not, uh, not that I can think of. Just the entire job over here that we had. 
but I will tell you that one of the examples of what our attitude was, we found a jar of industrial diamonds. Now, they were not the kind over here that you would put on your wedding band, ladies, you know? However, they were obviously, they meant uh, uh, they were worth a good deal of money. And I never forget that that jar of industrial diamonds sat on the desk of uh, Lieutenant Ford, and nobody, nobody uh, had the intention of opening it and taking any part of that particular one. That was our philosophy at that particular time. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Return it to the rightful owner. And that jar of industrial diamonds stands in my head as the, uh, it, uh, as the showpiece of the policy that we worked on over here. And uh, I'm damn proud over here that I don't have the industrial diamonds over here. <laughs> because I can tell you this much, my wife, may she rest in peace, she wouldn't have liked those diamonds on her wedding band. <laughs> Oh, okay. I read the book and I saw the, the movie and they were both, you know, fantastic. I couldn't understand why Hollywood deleted your names. That you were named or were your associates named as you were in the book. They changed all the names. Uh, Jim Romo became Jim Granger, you know, uh, on it over here. In my case, they changed my first name and my last name, you know? I became uh, Sam Epstein or, you know? What was the reason for the change? So that I couldn't collect any money over here for the movie. <laughs> A bunch of cheapskates. <laughs> and uh, 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 has, this been, has this laughter been recorded? Yeah. <laughs> Send it to George. <laughs> Tell him I want a little money over here for what I'm doing. <laughs> advertising his uh, advertising his movie over here on it. So I was uh, able to have an honor to share lunch uh, with a uh, Sergeant Etlinger, and uh, I learned that uh, he flew to Berlin and Milan with uh, George Clooney and uh, all other movie stars in two private airplanes. <laughs> and another interesting fact I found out. Uh, is that um, he was invited to the White House twice. Uh, first time was 2008 uh, with uh, President Bush because he was a part of the Monuments Men. And uh, he recently uh, went to the White House for uh, the showing of the film Monuments Men. Uh, so, you know, it's a, good to have a share lunch because you <laughs> learn a lot of little <laughs> interesting facts which you would not learn otherwise in a public lecture. So let's have a walk for our students. Ask them questions. This is a chance to get extra credits. Okay. <laughs> Back there. Okay, so please. Uh, sir, were you uh, in the mines while the Germans controlled the area, or did the Allies control the area? Right? Like, did you have to worry about being found? Yeah, I didn't so, hear. Uh, <laughs> was Germany controlled by the Allies, or were there Germans around, so you have to worry about safety or attacks by Germans? While you're in the mines. Yeah. While you're in the mines. Yeah. They learned over here that this Jewish kid was a good man. So uh, I didn't worry about uh, being, uh, being harmed while I was in charge of uh, the art being stored down in the, any of the two mines. And uh, I, uh, I would say that the miners were uh, very respectful of me. And uh, 
uh, and uh, treated me as a, a, a kind boss, so to speak. Uh, the, 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 the man who was in charge in a, uh, of the, in a Heilbronn mine, he was a real uh, business guy. He, he was mainly interested in making sure that they were busy on, uh, in that particular place. Uh, there were a number of projects over here that they had, aside from going, aside from mining, uh, they were putting up, a, uh, had to reconstruct the structures up at the top because they had been bombed uh, during the war. So he was more, more interested in that. And there was an interesting, uh, interesting case where the mine uh, needed, uh, needed uh, heat in order to melt the salt and purify it because it was uh, imbibed with rock. Uh, the the, the uh, mine over here, the salt that they found had about 10 to 20 percent rock in it, and they had to heat it up to 1,200 degrees, and then they spun it off into a big rotating map in order to re-solidify re, uh, it over here and into small rock pellets over here. So they had a, uh, <clears throat> they had excess, they had these ovens that made coke and they had an excess capacity of it. And so they established not only a, a, a place where they could come along and refine the salt, but they also established a factory that made glass bottles. And it was one of the first factories that was back in production in Germany. <coughs> I think about three or four months after the war ended. And what did it produce? It produced glass bottles for Coca-Cola. <laughs> that was one of the first factories that went back into production at that particular point, yeah. Yeah. Um, how many, were there, um, were there any Artifacts, any art that you weren't able to find the homes for, the, the rightful places for? Uh, they probably are close to, and that's the consensus of the monuments men which were, uh, which were there during the time that I served at the monuments men. There are probably three quarters of a million valuable paintings out there in the world that uh, do not have not been returned to their rightful owner. Okay, and you will hear about it in the next generations. Uh, I was involved a couple of years ago in the uh, return of art that had been taken uh, that the daughter-in-law of the largest art dealer in Holland, a Jewish man by the name of Goldsticker, had uh, had uh, with part of that particular, his particular collection. And she spent about 10 years in the Dutch courts in order to get her 200 paintings back. Because the Dutch were, had bought these paintings legally, and they naturally fought her 
in the Dutch courts to return to, for her to take them back at no cost to her, you know? And uh, one of them happened to be a painting by a painter by the name of, uh, I believe, Kim, uh, Quint or something like that over here. Uh, his paintings were, <coughs> were not really known until uh, later in the, during the middle of the 19th, uh, of the 20th century. And one of them uh, became known to be worth $130 million. Just one painting of hers. And she, as I said, she spent uh, her, her time in the, and there are probably many, many more cases like that. Uh, uh, I, I met her and her two daughters uh, in a muse uh, when they were in a museum. Of they had an exhibit of forty paintings of hers in the Bruges Museum in in Connecticut. But uh, my question is, they found two hundred. Where are the other twelve hundred paintings? You know, they're out there someplace, uh, belong uh, in the possession of somebody who really may have bought them legally, but someplace along the line of buying and selling and buying and selling, a, a, a Nazi culprit made money by selling something that he stole, and they put the money into a Swiss bank account. You know? Yes, just uh, last year, there was uh, this very amazing discovery of a Cornelius Gurlitz in Munich. Uh, you know, very unmarked apartment, they found 1,500 pictures from the Nazi period. His father, one of the Nazi dealers uh, of Nazi Germany, and that uh, nobody knew about that. They just happened to find it, and it's worth $1.4 billion. So it's coming. We'll hear more story about that. Yeah, and uh, expect, that's just 1,500, 15,000, expected to be by the time uh, generations go, three quarters of a million paintings that are out there. By the way, I recovered my grandfather's print collection, and uh, uh, on a, that's and they're now, as I said, sitting in my uh, one of my closets over here. So okay. they're for sale. <laughs> one last question. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. I'm a professor. Do I get extra credit too? <laughs> <laughs> so as, as a faculty member here, I work in the College of Education. And we talk a lot in my class about how what you do shows your philosophy. And I was very struck by what you said when you said you never touched that jar full of diamonds because it didn't belong to you. So you spend so much time preserving culture. And then you went to Nuremberg and you recorded history that is now part of our global culture. So what I'm wondering to you is when, when all of us as faculty go back to our classrooms and we talk to our students, in your life you've learned so much. What's the message that you feel like we need so that it doesn't ever happen again? We have to come along and if we, uh, we have to learn to respect other people's culture, as long as uh, as long as they respect your culture, that's the message that should be learned over here. Don't don't take it, don't steal it. Uh, help to make life a more peaceful, uh, uh, more peaceful in this particular planet by respecting each other's culture. That's the message. So, uh, we still have something, even the talk is over. So, many thanks for coming, and, uh, you know, I have to really thank uh, Spencer Scott, who is a director of a major and uh, plan gifts, because I was going to 
scale, you know, organize, uh, the help hold this uh, meeting in uh, atrium, I mean the, the library auditorium, thinking that the 100 is, this is hard to fill. And uh, Spencer keep pushing me, no, we gotta be, find a bigger place. <laughs> and he said, ballroom, what about the share return? I said, no way. <laughs> but I felt so sorry because he was uh, really <laughs> confident that a lot of people are gonna show up. So I finally said, okay, but the TV mind, you know, inside my mind, you know, it's not gonna happen. But then when I see so many of you, I'm very, you know, pleased for your presence. And I thank, thank Spencer for his uh, vision, visionary uh, ideas and also, uh, Spencer did a lot of work uh, for this uh, event, so I would like to thank Spencer oh, sure. very much. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Well, Harry, we are so grateful for you being here. Before you leave, we want to officially indoctrinate you into William Patterson University. So here's <laughs> Another gift as a token of our appreciation for you coming and speaking with us and enlightening us all about the monuments, man. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you.